Thank you very much. Uh, so on with the, uh, the next uh, part of our session, we have a presentation coming up here uh, on the preservation of the Sydney Lanier Cable Stay Bridge. Have Michael Craig, Senior Vice President of WSP, Hadam Salim with Vice President and Structural Engineer of WSP, and Aaron LaRoche, Senior Engineer of Pivot Engineers. You guys want to come up? Wow. Um, can you all hear me all right? All right. Um, this is um, a crowd of uh, esteemed colleagues here. Um, I, I, it's, it's a true honor to be here and, and speak in front of you all. Um, I know a lot of you, um, I'm, I'm super impressed by most of you, and I'm um, kind of humbled to be up here speaking right now, so thank you. Hey, John. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the preservation of the Sydney Lanier Bridge. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, a couple specific things we did on that bridge, and we're gonna go into uh, the load rating just a little bit, so um, here we go. I guess I had to control the slides. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sidney Lanier himself. So, you know, if you're important enough to get a bridge like this named after you, maybe you should spend a few minutes talking about the man the bridge was named after. Um, Sidney Lanier, um, he was around about uh, 150 years ago. Um, he was a great American poet. Um, I guess uh, I didn't know that, but uh, after I started working on this bridge for many years, it was something I wanted to, to learn about. Um, he only lived for uh, 39 years but long enough to get a bridge named after him. Oh, I think I skipped an extra slide there. Well, maybe not. Well, looks like we changed slides. Um, well, anyways, uh, Sidney Lanier, he, um, he wasn't well known when he was alive. He was born in Macon, Georgia, which is about 85 miles from here. Um, he went up to um, uh, John Hopkins, um, where he uh, was a professor. Um, he moved back and he died in, in North Carolina, uh, in Lynn, North Carolina. So um, a lot of different geography that he covered. Um, and like I said, he wasn't, he wasn't really well known when he was alive. Um, it was through his wife's efforts that kind of pushed his poetry out there that um, he became known as a, a great American poet. Very interesting. This was, this was the original um, Sidney Lanier Bridge. It was a, a movable span. Um, and an interesting thing about this that I, I found through the research was that it was designed by the uh, same folks that designed the uh, I-35W bridge in, uh, th that collapsed a few years back. Um, the original bridge was hit uh, a couple different times. It was, it was first hit by the uh, African Neptune, and this was um, in uh, November 7, 1972. This is about uh, 19 days before I was born, to put things in perspective. Um, there's a lot of writing up there. I don't know if you want to read it all, but it, it, it made national news. Um, the, the, the bridge was hit and 15 people died. This, this article came from, uh, I think, the New York Times. So it was very, it was very uh, big when it happened. That was back in 1972, 19 days before I was born. <clears throat> um, then again, as I was uh, entering high school, um, it was hit again. Um, by a Polish freighter, uh, Zimbia. I don't know if anyone can pr pronounce that, but uh, I think it's Zimbia. Um, I couldn't find a, a picture of the boat, so this is, this is the archbishop the boat was named after. <laughs> yeah. uh, no one died during this one, but it, it did cause a lot of damage. <clears throat> All right. I'm not really sure why that one ended up like that. All right. Um, so, um, I'm not really sure what happened, but I imagine after the bridge gets hit a couple times and imagine that they wanted to get some bigger ships through there, they decided that a high-level bridge was gonna be um, more appropriate for this crossing. So this, this was done um, by T.Y. Lin uh, back in, work began in 1995, and it was completed in 2003. So 1995, I was finishing my bachelor's at that point in time. And in 2003, I'd started engineering for about two years, so. That gives you kind of a time frame, what's going on there. And it, it, was, uh, it was a fire sale. It was only $65 million. So too bad we can't do that today. Um, so the, the new Sydney Lanier Bridge, again, lots of writing, I apologize, um, 
again, you don't need to read it. it it's about uh, 1,250 feet is the main span, and the two side spans are uh, 625 feet, I believe. Um, and it was, it was a balanced cantilever construction. In that photograph, you can see the new bridge uh, adjacent to the, the, older, uh, the older bridge. And here is just a uh, profile view giving you that same information. Again, uh, 1,250 feet side spans are 625. Uh, the approach spans are astro girders. I'm going to talk briefly about some inspection methods. Um, so, I'm, I know there's several of you that are inspectors out here, and several, several of you that have done the bridge inspections on large bridges like this. Um, it, it requires uh, unique skill sets. You need to have people that have spread access, um, being able to go down, put your hands on the anchorages on the outside. Um, and also, you want to use uh, man lifts. Uh, in this one, I think we used a 185-foot man lift to get as, you know, as high as we could with the man lift on the cables. Uh, we also use Aspen aerials uh, to inspect underneath. Um, we opened up uh, a lot of the anchorages and used a boroscope to do uh, in-depth inspection on those. Uh, we also utilize drones. You know, um, a drone is becoming um, pretty commonplace in inspections. I like to think of a drum like a hammer. It's, it's a tool. You got to know when to use it, when not to. And, and cable state bridges, there's, there's some definitely good uses for it. And I'll touch on that, I think. Um, here's just some, some photos. You know, if you do rope access, you got to show photos of people hanging, right? So um, here, here are some people hanging, uh, doing inspections, um, anchorages, um, and also the mainstay. <clears throat> and this, this is my, my favorite picture because I'm in it. Um, that's my back there. Uh, we're flying a drone. It, it, was, it was taken for marketing purposes, obviously, but um, it, it looks great. Um, so we, we use the drone for the inspection of the free length of the cables, as well as uh, to um, kind of help out with uh, inspection of the mass concrete. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of things that need to be inspected here. Now I want to go through the history of defects. So we started this project back around uh, 2000. 16, I, th I think. Um, so there were, there were other firms that helped do this work before us. Some of the defects that they found previously were, you know, what, what you'd expect, you know, uh, failed joints, spalled concrete, um, maybe some, some bearings were walking, those are on the approach spans. Um, normal things. Diagonal cracks in the edge girders, well, maybe not as normal, but, you know, not unseen in concrete. Um, my slides are messed up, guys. I'm sorry. Well, what, what, what you're looking at here is the um, stay pipes. So um, if you all are familiar with uh, cable stay bridges, there's a stay pipe that comes down through the deck and gets anchored into the edge girders. All right? The stay pipe is made out of steel, and that's the, what you see on the outside there. Um, what you see going into the stay pipe is an HTPE duct. Inside that duct are the tendons, and they're, they're, they're grouted in this instance. Um, what you see above that little, little yellow arrow there a little bit is the neoprene uh, boot that kind of is supposed to encapsulate it and keep the water from getting into it. Well, this is one of the problems they found when they were out there, um, water intrusion. So this is back in 2011, and you can imagine you don't want to have um, tendons in water. So this was, this was a big deal. Um, this, is, this is something else they found. So inside that stay pipe, if you can, if you can stay with me, that stay pipe comes out of the deck, the steel stay pipe. Inside there, there there's a neoprene uh, dampener. Um, and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing that neoprene dampener adjacent to the HDP pipe. Um, that HDP pipe is being worn up and down against that neoprene dampener. So there, there's some debris in there, and that's, that's HDP pipe just being worn away. Um, you can start to think to yourself, okay, you've got an HDE, HDE pipe being worn away, and there may be water intrusion. So red flags start going off in our heads. <clears throat> um, here are the recommendations um, from that 2011 report. <clears throat> and I, yeah, so one of them was to monitor, um, monitor the cables because they had some indication that these, these cables were oscillating, um, maybe more than they were supposed to causing this wear with that dampener in the HDE pipe. And they also, also they found um, 
one, one tendon in there that had um, worn all the way through and had active corrosion. Um, and they said, let's monitor that one over, uh, over the 60 months. So in 2016, again, too much writing, sorry. In 2016, when WSP, when we started this project, um, and I should give, I should give credit here. Um, so WSP was teamed up with uh, Pivot Engineers as well as String Tech. Uh, I know there's some guys from String Tech here as well. So uh, this, was, this was a group effort. Um, we came in and we, our first job was to open up, I think, 49 of these cables. Um, remove that neoprene bearing or neoprene, neoprene dampener and take a look at what's going on with the HDP duct. So here I think I have a video if I can figure out how to play it. So this was, this was what we saw when we first started the project, it was, I don't know, a day or two in. You can imagine, um, you know, I'm, I'm a structural engineer, a bridge guy, I've been doing this for 20 years, I've never seen something like that. Um, that it was a little unnerving. Um, and I can imagine for the public driving, driving across that bridge, they were, they were a little more unnerved than I was. So there was definitely uh, that, that bullet point that they talked about, monitor the cables for oscillations. Check, yeah, we have a problem. Okay, we did that piece. <clears throat> oh, let's see if we can do it again. So in 2016, uh, we opened up 49 of these, and this was what we started to see. Uh, in this instance, that the, the neoprene dampener on the outside, you can see the gap between that and the HDEP duct. Um, that's a problem, that things aren't working right there. And you can see in the bottom left corner, some of the debris from the HTP. Oop, one too many maybe. Um, we also found instances where the HTP duct was cracked or broken or worn through. Um, sorry guys. Um, here it's completely holed through, exposing the grout, and you can start to see some tendons. Um, and this, this was the duct that they saw back in 2011. They said, um, let's make sure we monitor this one. So this was five years later, 2016. Um, we had active corrosion in the tendons. Um, there was pitting, um, some, some surface corrosion. Uh, we, we found uh, many instances of this um, across, across the bridge. So here, here's just a table summarizing. Um, so I think there's 23 locations here, and you can see that um, you know we, we had many cases that they were hold through almost every one, um, grout gone, exposing the tendons, active corrosion, not not what you want to see. This this table um, I think is very interesting. So if you go back to that um, video I showed you guys a couple minutes ago. I don't know if you noticed, but one side of the bridge, the, the cables were oscillating um, pretty vigorously. On the other side, there was hardly any movement. So it was on the eastern side, you know, maybe the, the wind, the vortex is coming off the eastern um, towers was, was causing it. But if you look on this table, um, you see the blue lines? They represent the eastern side of the bridge where we had different, different levels, different degrees of problems. And then the uh, orange lines are on the western side. So um, I, I, maybe, Maybe it's just um, one occurrence, but I, I think that this is this is a key to, to key to the issue was that that oscillation, you know, is causing the ducts to wear through. Thus, you're having more issues. The eastern side, the vortex, the winds. Um, I didn't I didn't put it through a wind tunnel, but I, I think that's what we had going on there. <clears throat> um, so here are the recommendations. Um, we, we wanted to uh, repair those hold through issues, right? Um, we can't we can't leave that out there. Um, we want to install uh, new dampeners on the cables to, to prevent this from occurring again. Uh, we recommended installing acoustic monitoring um, so that we could uh, isolate, know, know where the, if we had a cable or wire break, where it was. Um, we wanted to um, do a, a load rating on the structure because we had some degree of section loss. Um, we wanted to obtain grout samples and test them to see if that was, you know, potentially a cause for the corrosion, although we strongly didn't think it was, but, you know, we were there. We should take care of that. Um, uh, the dewatering, uh, we got to prevent the water from getting into the system and uh, rewrap the cables again along with that dewatering. So here, here are the stars. 
This is, this is what's been accomplished. You ready? We should clap for each one. No. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, the repairs have been done, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, the external dampeners have been installed uh, with uh, great success. Um, we, we've done the load rating, and everything looks good. And uh, Hotham's going to talk about that. Um, uh, the grout testing we sent out, there was uh, no issues. Um, the dewatering and the rewrapping was um, kind of taken care of during the construction. Uh, we we rewrapped the cables and dewatered them. So the only thing we didn't do was the acoustic monitoring. Um, and I don't know, maybe Steve Austin's here. They, they installed acoustic monitoring on the Friend Hart Hartman Bridge. Um, I, I guess we're, we're just trying to see um, you know, whether or not the, the results will be actionable, uh, if there will be too many false flags. So we're still discussing that. Uh, we'll, we'll see where we end up with that one. <clears throat> um, and I'm just about done, guys. But this, this is um, uh, just a repair scheme that was done uh, for that uh, hold through HDPE duct. Um, what we had to do is we had to go in and actually cut the steel stay pipe, uh, slide it up the axis uh, of the uh, cable stay to access this area. Then we had to cut out the HTP uh, duct, um, clean the, 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 the strands that were there, uh, install corrosion inhibitors, as well as uh, we installed the sacrificial anodes to help protect that area and surrounding. Um, and then uh, we had to weld new HTPE duct on it, uh, pump it with grout, um, and then slide that steel pipe back down, uh, re-weld it, um, reinstall the boots. Um, yeah, that, it, it was, that was the repair. How did you clean interior strands? Uh, we, <clears throat> we didn't. Um, we couldn't clean the interior strands. Um, here, here's the protective tape. Um, this is a, a detail. Uh, one of the interesting things about this detail was we uh, extended the tape uh, up beyond the, the boots uh, to help uh, seal off the uh, inside of this. Um, and there, were, there was some difficulty in that just because of the, the forming. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to talk about the, uh, the dampening system. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm with Pivot Engineers in Austin, Texas, and we were lucky enough to get to work with WSP and Strintag on this, and we were focused specifically on installation of the damping system to, to basically sort out these vibration problems that we got going on. And we're gonna show you the same video here. This is the problem that we were basically tasked to fix. Um, and so, What's going on here is actually really interesting. This happens in um, light rain and light wind. And what happens is in light rain, you get a little water droplet that forms and runs down the top and bottom sides of the stays. And that little water droplet, or line of water, bead of water, kicks off those vibrations. And it only happens in certain conditions. If the rain is too, too much, you'll get kind of a sheet flow and that bead won't, won't form. If the wind is too high, the bead will get washed off and if the wind is too low, the water will just fall off. So you just have these very specific conditions in which this happens, which is really interesting. Um, but that's, that's what we have to sort out. And in this project, we were lucky enough to have some drawings to start with and that had really great information for us to, to get into. The first thing we want to look at is the geometry of the stay, the geometry of the deck around the stay so that we can uh, accommodate any future retrofit. Uh, these drawings actually had stay cross section, stay geometry information, as well as estimated tension under different loading conditions. And what we were able to do with this was estimate the natural frequencies of these stays as they're vibrating, which was really important to us as we went out in the field. Uh, this is us in the field. Uh, we spent about two weeks at the bridge um, when we basically stuck a ge uh, an accelerometer and measured uh, the geometry at each stay. And so we're right there measuring the, excel measuring the different geometric uh, conditions that are going to affect our retrofit. We've installed the accelerometer 
And we also have uh, basically a really, really fancy system of a climbing rope and climbing harness that we're going to use to excite this day in the video. Uh, and this is basically went from one end of the bridge to the other, measuring the, uh, these conditions and the natural frequency. And what you'll see here is, I think that's me, uh, basically hooking up the, the climbing rope here, and I'm going to just basically use my body weight to, to excite this day. Uh, it took us about half a day to figure out that we needed a metronome uh, on, our, on our phone to plug in the natural frequency and then basically pull to that beat. Uh, and that got the stay excited. And if we were off by a couple beats per minute or so, we would basically damp out the stay and we wouldn't get any of the excitation that you see there. So what we're adding the video. Um, let's see if we can just kind of fast forward here. Uh, so, <laughs> what you end up seeing is that we, we pull up on, we pull the stay, and then we let go, and the stay is able to basically oscillate under its own excitation at that point. And what we're looking for is really the modes of vibration and the natural frequency associated with each of these modes. And what this is is how the cable is oscillating between the tower and between the deck. And what we find is, for example, this is one of the stays. This is the acceleration with time. And what we see is some relatively high accelerations that don't really damp out for, say, the first 30 seconds or so. And these accelerations and movement is what's driving the damage that Michael was showing you. And this is what we want to prevent. And we can decompose these data on the right-hand side there is the same data. We're just looking at how these accelerations are occurring in each of the first six modes here. And what we see is, in this case, the first two modes are governing the behavior, and in general, the first three modes on the previous slide I was showing are the worst case. Those are where we're getting the highest amplitude accelerations, which means we're causing damage and fatigue cycles in those, in those modes. So that's what we want to sort out. What we did was we installed a linear viscous damper, basically at each stay. Um, this in itself was a fun little optimization problem. Uh, so to start with, the higher up the stay we are, the better the performance of the damper is going to be. So we want to increase that relative to the deck, but at the same time we need to be at a place where somebody could, you know, get their hands on it and install it. So here we are. Um, we also need to optimize this damper to basically take out the vibrations, but take out the problematic vibrations. If we were to design the damper to resist just mode one, we'd basically put a pin right there. We'd get great response for mode one, but mode two and three would still cause damage. So, um, and the other part of that, I guess, is that we can't have a specific damper for every one of the 176 stays. I don't think the, the Georgia Department of Transportation would have been very happy with us if we did that. Uh, so we came up with eight dampers. Um, we optimized those to some weighted average between mode two and mode three, and what we found through that process was that by that, we were able to get our damping or our accelerations under a critical threshold for modes one all the way through mode 11 for every one of the 176 days. So we were pretty happy about that. And that's all great on paper, um, but you know, it's got to work in the field. Um, and so, if we transfer basically theory now to installed, uh, we're doing the same thing at the same bridge again and testing it. About, about here now is where we're no longer uh, exciting the stay. And if we would have gotten through the whole of the first video compared to this, what we see is much, much lower oscillations under the same excitation. And this is a great indication that our dampers are indeed working which was pretty exciting for us to, to go out and see when it's installed. Uh, but what does the data look like, let's say? Uh, so same stay, comparison with the damper and without the damper, that 30 second high amplitude accelerations are now damped out in about 15 seconds and we're getting about a quarter of the excitation, or the quarter of the acceleration. So we're doing pretty good. Um, and if we look at kind of our optimization, the, where we're at with respect to each stay in terms of the acceleration. Now our modes one and two at 0 0.3, 0 0.04, 0 0.04 uh, Gs are way down here. 
So we've significantly improved the behavior over those first three modes, which was their design intent. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have pushed the behavior out to higher modes and look at the, look at the difference between all the modes. So I would say uh, that through all that, we had a pretty successful installation of the dampers. I, I think the bridge is performing much better now. So, okay, load rating. I'll just quickly go through the load rating effort that we have done to load, load, uh, load rate the bridge. So the main span is 1,250 feet. That's the main span of the cable state bridge with two side spans of 625 feet each. The superstructure is made of reinforced concrete beams and the uh, floor beams, the transverse beams are post-tension concrete. Just quickly, the load rating criteria, we consider the dead loads, definitely the live loads design and uh, legal loads for Georgia DOT, the emergency vehicles as well, and uh, thermal loads has to be considered for the cables, and wind loads were considered for the analysis uh, and the rating of the towers and the anchor piers. The creep and shrinkage, that is um, definitely has to be considered for a concrete bridge, and for a cable state bridge, that's uh, one of the main uh, loads that the cable state bridge is subjected to is the creep due to the high axial force in the superstructure and the construction live loads as well. Uh, to, to analyze the bridge, we had to develop a detailed full three-dimensional numerical model using finite element analysis. And definitely in this model, we had to represent the cables using truss elements while considering the effect of the sag, which is the main feature of the cable element versus truss elements. Uh, we also had to do nonlinear second order analysis, and that's uh, because of the cable state bridges, superstructures are subjected to high axial force, which will introduce a P delta effect, which has to be considered in the superstructure as well as the towers. You have the time dependent material properties, and that what will enable uh, considering the creep and the shrinkage effect for the materials as a concrete material. And the main challenge also for the cable state bridges is determining the pre-tensioning forces in the stays or the cables, which is definitely dependent on the construction method, but we calibrated the forces in the model to ensure that the superstructure girders are subjected to minimum bending moment, and we made sure that the permanent forces in the cables in the model were matching with those identified on the as-built plans. And this is just an overview of the entire model after the completion or at the uh, final stage. Uh, for the load rating, definitely we have six different elements that has to be considered for the load rating of the entire bridge, which are the cables, the edge girders, the main girders, the transverse floor beams, the deck, the towers, and the anchor piers as well. Due to the time limitation, I will just highlight the load rating of the cables, which is the one of the main carrying elements. So as you can see from this picture, each stay had 22 cables uh, in the side span and another 22 in the main span. When we did the load rating, we had to consider the findings from the corrosion. So there were 12 cables that were identified with the corrosion. Four of them were estimated to have 5% section loss and another 12 cables were estimated to have 10% section loss. Uh, one of the main uh, just highlight features for the cable state that you have to determine the loading span to be able to determine the maximum tension force in each cable. So for example, for the uh, main stay cable one, which is the main back stay cable, you have to load the entire main span. And the reason for determining the loaded length for each cable is basically you determine what is the maximum loaded length of the bridge for each cable that will produce the maximum tension force. And based on the determined loaded length, you determine what is the impact factor that you will use with the live load. So for cable state bridges, the impact factor, it's not one number for every element. So for every cable, for example, you have a different impact factor based on the loaded length. And just in summary, I mean the cables that did not have any corrosion, uh, the minimum rating factor was 1.5 for the cables, and that is for the case of dead and live load. 
And when you cons consider the thermal effect, the rating factor goes to 2.13, and that's not a mistake. Basically, that when you consider thermal loads, your allowable stresses are increased. So for dead and live, it is only 45% of your ultimate tensile strength. When you include the thermal effect, your allowable stresses increase to 50% of your ultimate tensile strength. For the corroded uh, cables, uh, the one that had a 10% corrosion had a rating factor, a minimum rating of 1.11, which means that the cables had enough or sufficient strength to resist the dead and live loads. Um, by this, I just conclude the load rating uh, part, and I think that will conclude the presentation as well. Unless yep. Mike would like to no, no, no. talk about this slide. That includes it. I, I just, I think I have a, a poem from Sidney Lanier. I think I should uh, put up here if I can get it. Thank you. Nope. My slides are messed up. Sorry, guys. No Sidney Lanier poem. Oh, here it is. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.